Um, and just want to say welcome to everybody. I'm going to turn it over to our moderator, Vanessa, who is an associate professor from Paul College. Thank you, Vanessa, for being here. Thank you, Jen. Uh, it is my great pleasure to be here with everyone today. I've been looking forward to this panel. We have a dynamite group of UNH alums uh, to talk with us about what economists are calling the great re resignation. And so what we wanna know today is, is it the great resignation, great opportunity? You know, how do we capitalize on this kind of change? So I'm just gonna open with giving you just a few statistics and then um, and a sense of where we're going today. And then um, we'll open up some questions for the panelists. Um, as you probably have heard in some places um, during this great resignation, uh, specifically between April and, and September of last year, 24 million American employees left their jobs. Um, now, a lot of people think that this is only happening in blue collar uh, America, but it's actually 50-50 uh, in both blue collar and white collar. Um, it is true that most people who've left jobs have left retail jobs. However, the second most uh, industry that's losing people is management consulting, and third is the technology industry. And so a lot of people in a lot of places are going. So the, the three questions that we're gonna focus on today in general, we'll see where the conversation goes, but in general, first question is why? Why are people leaving? Second question is about um, it, those of us or those of you who are thinking of leaving their jobs, is this um, really a shift in power? Um, is it a good idea to leave? Um, if I'm thinking of, of changing, what, what, can, what advice can you give right now? Um, how do we take advantage of what's happening? And then the third question will be for those who are employers. Uh, what does this mean for us? Um, how should we be reacting? How do we retain our best employees? Um, one of the things that we know um, um, from research is that the people who leave tend to be the best employees because they have the most opportunities. And so how do we retain and how do we recruit during this period? What does it mean for employers that so many people are leaving? So on that note, I'm gonna um, open it up with the first question, which is why are people leaving? So uh, who would like to take that first question, uh, panelists? Uh, let's start with Dave. I'm gonna start with you, Dave, and then, then we'll go around the circle, please. Absolutely. Yeah, thank you so much for having me. Um, my name is Dave Mary. I'm Associate Provost for Career Education and Professional Development um, at Suffolk University, um, UNH grad of 05. Um, I've been working in that career higher education interface space for about 12 years now. Um, it's been an interesting time to be in that space. Um, I think why people are leaving now is um, both the opportunity that COVID provided for people to, to have some space, to have some downtime to both upskill and reflect on their job a bit. Um, it's difficult to job search while you're actively working sometimes. Um, but also, you know, I think a lot of people felt disaffected by the way that their companies handled the COVID crisis. And then they're looking for that flexibility that they can find elsewhere. So a lot of, a lot of it is um, leaving their current employer, not necessarily always to find a better new opportunity, but being disaffected with their previous employer. And also, again, that opportunity that opened up in the sort of the COVID space where people reflected on lots of parts of their lives um, and made some pretty drastic changes in their employment, but also in other ways as well. Um, so I view things really from um, the, the employee side of things often, but Bethany, I know you oftentimes see things from so the employer perspective. Yeah, thanks so much, Dave. Uh, my name is Bethany Cooper, and I lead our global talent acquisition and talent development teams at CoreLogic. We are a data-driven software company in the real estate space. Um, and you're absolutely right. Really, when I step back and look at um, the, the last couple of years, it was late in 20 when our talent teams really started feeling a change in climate. What was happening was, you know, COVID was well, we're kind of in the thick of it. Um, and we were at the end of the year and companies who had not hired all year, they've been holding off, um, really began to ramp up for the new year. Um, and then going into first quarter of 21, what we saw was a 200 to a 400% increase in openings, um, which just created huge competition um, 
which coincided, I'm calling it the great talent perfect storm because it coincided with the great resigna resignation. So supply and demand, I mean, right there, there, there people were stepping out, um, they were leaving their jobs, they were applying for new jobs, compensation went through the roof, companies were just really having to compete to find that top talent. Um, and so it's created that that um, sort of crazy talent environment that, that really still goes on. My company last year um, filled 1,800 roles, and, and I promise you, it almost feels like we were standing still, right? Um, there's just so much movement going on. So at any given time, we have about 600 openings in our organization right now. So, so interesting times. Super. Thanks. Corey, tell yeah. us a little bit about yourself, and then, yeah, so and then what are your thoughts? Thank you. Yeah, Kerry Tober. I'm the vice president of franchise development over at a company called the Repin Group. Uh, we're a strategic uh, franchise growth partner in the in the franchising space. And uh, I think I bring a little bit of a unique perspective to what we have on this panel because we're we're dealing with corporate refugees every single day. So there's a lot of people who, as Dave pointed out, they had some time to reflect during the pandemic. And a lot of that reflection lead, led them to believe, I don't want to work the normal job that I'm working. And they have a fair amount of pain. Um, couple that with the fact that, you know, our market hit an all-time high. And a lot of times people have these, these built up 401ks that they can now access um, pre-tax wise to invest in franchises or other businesses. Uh, we're seeing a humongous amount of, of franchising starts in our, our industry right now. And, um, you know, to your point, retail, took a heck of a beating in 2020, uh, but we had service brands right there to, to pick up. And so people could run that from the flexibility of their own house, their own schedule. And now what we're seeing is across the entire industry, everything's back. People are just looking and, and the pain is real. People don't wanna be going back to the office. They don't wanna be getting in the car and commuting and they don't want the, the, the same security that a W2 once, once had for them. It's, it's not the same anymore. Okay. So it's true that the balance of power has shifted a little bit in this, in this situation. Good. So um, what should people do if they want to take advantage of the, of the current market? What's, um, and how do you decide where to go? You know, if there, it really is about um, you know, not wanting the same old thing they've had in the past. And some of the research says that it's about organizational culture, a lot of toxic, a lot of um, overworked employees out there how do you decide and what do you do um let's who wants to start let's go let's go around the circle again dave how about you yeah sure thing um i we work with lots of alumni from where i work now suffolk who are in that boat um and there's a real clear differentiator from people who are leaving an organization and people who are seeking a new organization and it sounds like splitting hairs but i think being honest with yourself about what you're doing um if you're leaving a culture that you hate and sort of reaching out everywhere that looks very different than actively pursuing something new. And so what I recommend for folks is that this is a time to actively pursue that thing. So one recommendation that I have for folks is have that clarity. There are so many greats, the great resignation, the great this. One of the ones that I like is the great reshuffle. Um, that's the Guy Berger, the, the CEO of LinkedIn called it. Um, but folks aren't leaving the workforce, they're leaving their job and moving around, kind of like what both of you were saying, Carrie and um, Bethany. But that means that there's lots of competition as well. There's lots of churn and lots of noise. So if you're out there just kind of looking, this is not a great time for that to sort of be exploring. This is a great time to actively target something you want to be at. So my, rec my recommendation is typically be very clear in what you're looking for. Be very clear of what your expectations are going in. Um, if you're leaving for certain um, salary uh, reasons or for benefits, know those and have those set in stone early on. The clearer you are in your purpose, the more successful you, successfully you can take advantage of this like really unique time, I'd say. Sure. So just quick follow-up to that. I mean, how, how do you get clear on what you want? I know you're, you're in that, that, that space in your job, Dave. Um, how do you get clear? And should you be clear on uh, the tasks you're doing, the environment you're in? How, how do you advise people on that? Yeah, I think that, that that's where taking some really reflect, some, some reflective time. So I think a lot of, again, when you see someone who wants to just leave their job, it's very evident that they haven't done that sort of thinking about what, what, is, what is wrong? What's the real core purpose of why I'm leaving? Um, oftentimes we ask people to sort of think about their, their dream environment in terms of task, but also in terms of culture, as you mentioned. So what are the aspects of the work that you find really desirable and enjoyable? There's a, an aspect of life design, sort of this design thinking mentality that you can go through where you think about what brings me joy currently, what's the root cause of that, and how do I find more of that? Um, so I really enjoy X, Y, and Z parts of my job now, 
maybe I don't need to do, do those tasks, but I know I like those because they let me interact with new people every day, or they let me really organize, uh, use my critical thinking skills. The more you can get at the root of what you love doing now, what parts of it you love, the better able you are to seek that out in a new job. Um, and so that's the type of thing where, again, if you come to an employer and say, I just got to find something new, they're going to go, yeah, everyone's leaving us. We're not going to hire someone who's not sure. But if you come to them and say, I know I love doing this work and that's why I want to work for you, that's a, they're going to feel much more confident bringing you on because they need that stability. They need that assuredness from their, their candidates right now. Okay, super. Thanks. Um, yeah, go, Carrie, go ahead. I'm, I'm curious to see how... Exceptionally, it's exceptionally yeah. um, complementary to what Dave just said in the franchising space, right? And there's a number of resources out there that... You can go talk to a franchise consultant. You can go speak with a director of development. Uh, but the, the same thing that Dave just said is when you go evaluate a business, especially something that you're going to have a 10 or, or more uh, long-term relationship with, you're looking for a cultural fit. You're looking for a team that's going to be able to support you. You're looking to be in the industry that you're in because if you go down the path and you're not laser clear as to what your expectations are to get out of that business, you're going to turn around in a year, year and a half and be very upset with, with the decision you made. Um, we have a moniker that we use and it's, it's tongue in cheek these days, but it's your wife, your life and your money. Right. And so what that speaks to is how is the relationship that you are going to have with your job, your career, or your business, um, into, into the industry going to affect your personal relationships at home? How's it going to affect the life that you live and that you want to live? And what is it going to have of an impact from your funding, right? Of your, of your financial capability. Um, and I think all those things are very different for different people. And it's very important when you come to the table that you have clarity as to what you're looking for in that exploration process. And how do you get that clarity? I mean, especially if you're thinking about going the franchise route, um, how do you decide what, what, what would you recommend? Well, it's kind of like dating, right? You don't typically marry the first person that you go on a first date with. So you go out and you get to know a lot of people. And I think, you know, in the franchise industry, we're all pretty accustomed to a lot of these first dates. Um, I, I can't speak about the, the regular job industry as we have the two professionals here to speak to that. But, you know, in, in my experience in, in looking for a job, it's always you put a lot of effort into what you're investing into. Um, same on the investment side. I'm looking for somebody coming to me saying, I looked at your website. I, I reviewed this information. I have these critical questions before I get into it, because that's an impressive uh, understanding of what that person has from a capability and an understanding of, of what they're looking to do. I just want to jump in with that in that, that dating metaphor we use sometimes when we talk about informational interviews. Um, I think a lot of times, again, I keep coming back to a lot of what I'm hearing is disaffection with current work. Um, and so what I tell people is, Set up a meeting with a UNH alum who's doing the work that you'd like to do. Hop on LinkedIn, search through, and see who's doing something akin to what I want to do now. And I guarantee there are skeletons in the closet of that job as well. And it's better to be prepared for that. It might not turn you off of it, but to be, um, to, again, to sort of date around and say, tell me more about what it's really like to work at this company, in this industry, in this role. Um, that's a great way to, to sort of prototype, like, do I enjoy this? Is it really what I want to seek? Or is the grass look greener from where I'm at now? Sure, super, thanks. Bethany, how about you? What, what would you, what advice would you give people who are thinking about moving? Prior to corporate in my previous life, I have run career centers at universities. So I love the idea of the informational interview. I don't, my statistic is probably outdated, but it used to be that one in every 12 informational interviews turns into a job. Um, and so really that is an awesome opportunity to learn, but then also to make those connections for those future, future roles. Um, ultimately, a candidate's a candidate's market, right? You all are interviewing your employers as much as we're interviewing you. Um, and so knowing that going in, knowing what's important, like this panel has been saying, and being able to ask the right questions to try and discern if that is the right culture, if that, if that is a role where you can have an impact. You know, I think what we're finding um, from an employer standpoint is we have to really step back and make sure um, that we are meeting those needs of this, um, I don't want to say new environment out there, but it definitely um, is a little bit of a power shift as, as we reference. So, you know, the number one thing that I see, particularly in our data and technology type roles, is those, those candidates want to make an impact. They want to change an industry. They want to revolutionize things. They don't want to just come and be a number somewhere. Um, so how are your roles enabling your teams to make decisions to have that impact? Um, you know, I think they also uh, are looking at jobs as a way to communicate, collaborate, be part of a team, be part of something with other people. Even if they're not physically in the office, um, they want to have that connection. 
So as leaders, you know, doing quick stand-up meetings every day, having this, making sure videos are on, making sure people are are uh, bonding uh, with their peers and and have good collaboration, I think is super important, um, and that people are listened to and heard. That's that's really valuable. Um, there's a lot of question about well, how do we measure performance in this new world, right, where we're not necessarily physically sitting in an office. And I think, you know, challenge our leaders to think beyond butts and seat, right? Um, how do you measure performance today, even if somebody's sitting in the cube next to you, right? Um, you know, as good leaders, you have to think about how, how to inspire, how to grow, how to measure um, performance. And it's not always just, you know, visibly seeing somebody. And then lastly, I would say trust. Um, you know, our, our businesses have to trust our employees. Uh, we have to put that trust in them. Um, we have to lead them. Um, we have to be super engaged as leaders in this new world um, and really extend that trust um, to the team. So I think, you know, when you're interviewing, when you're the candidate, I think you need, if, if that's all important to you, you need to be asking the questions to determine if that's what the environment is like. And then um, for those of us who are, you know, leading teams like that, I think we need to think about, are we delivering on all of that? And then one last thing, I'm a big podcast, big book reader. Um, Simon Sinek, I love him. Um, the Infinite Game, he spends quite a bit of time in that book talking about the just cause. And so this all made me think about um, two things. So as an organization, what is your just cause, right? And how do you leave your organization better than you found it? Um, and I often think an example of that uh, is my talent team. We're essentially salespeople, right? We're selling the business. We're going out and finding talent and trying to sell them on roles. Uh, it can feel very transactional. I said 1,800 roles we filled this last year, right? It can feel like the minute you fill a role, like you celebrate, you ring the bell, and then you got another one waiting in line behind you, right? Um, and so working with my team, we've had to think about how, how to make it not transactional, right? What is the just cause of this team? Um, and so we had a retreat and really spent time uh, talking about it as a team. And the team came up with the idea that we are changing lives. So we are not just recruiting people, but we are ultimately impacting people's lives. I think one of the panelists said that earlier, right? Um, and then, you know, that made me step back and think about what is my just cause um, in life? And, and, and I think that gets at what kind of job are you looking at if you spend that time to say, hey, what's my purpose? Um, and what am I looking for in this next step? So roundabout way to get back to the beginning of that question. But if you haven't read The Infinite Game, it's great. Super. Thanks. Um, question from the audience uh, with regard to making change. What if you're open to a, um, you're looking for more money? Um, what's the best way to get a raise? Do you actually need to leave your company? Um, how would you recommend um, that you you approach that? And I also want to uh, bring up the issue of the gender issues around that. Um, some of the research shows that when a woman asks for a raise, um, it can really do more harm because women are not supposed to um, be that aggressive. So uh, let's, Dave, let's start with you on this one. Yeah, sure thing. Um, I think that, you know, unfortunately, the statistics show that it's easier to get more money when you leave your organization. That's just, that's sort of the, typically, that's when that happens is, you know, it's, it's harder to ask for a raise when you already work somewhere than it is to get a higher salary in a new position. That's not to say that's the only way, but just if you're looking at it from a, a sheer statistics point of view. Um, but I did want to say that this is a great time because employers are really looking to keep talent, um, that balance is shifting a bit. Um, and it's a great time to um, look for salary, um, salary increases, um, but even, even more so look for those standard of living changes. So whether that be more hybrid work, um, you know, benefits, whether that be um, more vacation time, um, employers are much more willing, and, and I'm sure Bethany is sort of fielding some of these questions with, with candidates, to be um, more flexible with that. So I think what that needs to be paired with is a really, again, I keep talking about clarity, but coming with a clear value proposition. Here's what I've done for you as an employee. Now here's what I want, as opposed to here's what I want if you want to keep me. I think all the time saying, look what I've done for you so far. Um, sub, you know, The subtext being like, think how hard it would be to train somebody to do this if I left. And now here's what I'm asking to keep me here. Um, I think there's also some value in saying, you know, the salary piece is harder to do this with, although you can absolutely ask for that. But to say, here's how much more productive I can be if I'm working remotely. Here's how much more productive I can be if X, Y, and Z is happening. So coming with the data to back it up when you're asking for those things is really helpful. Doing a quick glass door around what are your benchmark salaries and other places making to sort of, again, have some data to back up that request. Okay, super. Okay. Um, 
Carrie, I'm going to come to you with another question. So I'm going to come back to Bethany with with the follow up to to what Dave just said. What are your thoughts about that with regard to asking for a raise internally? And I want to add something to that, Bethany. What about if you're changing industries? You know, I mean, we've talked about going back and looking at what's you know what you really want. Can you assume you're going to get a, a raise by changing industries? And and um, so those are two questions really. But go ahead, Bethany. Uh, so great questions. I would reiterate, um, I think understanding that the market has moved. It has moved pretty dramatically this past year when it comes to compensation. Um, I am queen of, um, I loved your question about uh, women versus men. Um, I am queen of being politely and charmingly persistent. Um, I think you can ask for anything if you do it in a way that is charming and, and, uh, and polite and you don't back yourself into a corner and you can really show, um, to Dave's point, show the, show the market data, show um, the trends, uh, you know, even having another offer uh, out there. I wouldn't necessarily say go get another offer in order to um, bring that back for a counter with your, with your company, but, but sometimes it does take that. Um, and we do see that quite a bit um, if you do want to stay where you are, but really understanding your value and where that market has moved um, is important. And you can do that basic research um, really all over the web. Those informational interviews are another great way to understand too, talking to real humans and, and what they're paying in their teams. So I think building that case, doing it um, in a way that is very business matter of fact, um, and like, look, I'm, I, I want to stay here. I am passionate. I love what we're doing. I am 100% on board. I just feel like the market has moved and I'm no longer you know, being paid what, what uh, the market is paying. Um, I think making that case is, is really important. Changing industries, I think a lot of companies right now um, recognize fundamentals, right? Um, and that in some cases, we're actually looking for people from different industries uh, so that we can have a different perspective, something innovative, a new way to think about what we've been looking at. Um, so changing industries is not a, it's not a negative. It's really looking at what are the basics. You have the basic fundamental skills for whatever the role is. And then what can you add? I'm a big fan, too, of not saying, oh, they fit in here. Fit in that, you know, to me, that is a really outdated phrase. I don't want everybody to look the same. Um, I want a culture add. I want somebody that's adding to my team um, and bringing different skills. So, so those are things I think we we can we can really leverage, right? And what are you bringing to a team that might be different than everybody that's sitting in that seat today? Super. Thank, thank you, Bethany. Okay, Carrie, um, moving to a different question for you. Uh, another one from the audience is about um, your thoughts on the great resignation really being about people being sick and tired of um, the micromanagement and the long hours and things in current workplace. It reminds me of a book by um, a labor um, a labor person named Sarah Jaffe who writes for, for newspapers and things. She says, your job won't love you back. And so stop being exploited by it. So I know that you talk a lot to a lot of people who, who um, are tired of uh, the sort of corporate culture. What are they telling you? And what, what's the difference when you own a franchise? Yeah, and I, I think, you know, part of this and from the last question too, I was, I was going to ask you guys, like, what, what tax bracket are you in on your W-2s? Because when you own your own business, the sky's the limit, right? And you can really... Put, invest your money, grow that business, do what you want to do. And when you're at a job, you have a limitation on it. And, you know, if I, if I share a quick anecdote with you, um, at one of my previous employers, I remember going through a review process and sitting there with my boss and him telling me, well, you're at the top of your band. So we're going to have to figure out what we're doing with you next year. Right. And that's not anything you want to hear because there's really a limitation. There's almost a holdback as to what you're going to do. So I, I think to address your question, the pain point is, exactly what we're hearing. You know, people are confused about what the employer is ultimately offering them. I think there's been a hard conversation about what that shift looks like. Um, a, a book that I was thinking about as, as, as Dave and, and, and Bethany were talking about is obviously Rich Dad Poor Dad, right? Like save your money, invest, put yourself in a position where you have those assets to create long-term wealth. And that's what I see a lot of people doing. They're, they're not only confused about their employers and, and there's pain in, in what they have to do on a day-to-day -day basis of no longer 40 hours, but 60 or 80 hours a week. But the only vehicle that they know for investment at this point is maybe I could buy a rental property or, hey, I got this 401k. And that's about the limitation as to where we, we go. 
Um, on our side of the equation, it's just as much matchmaking as it is for both Bethany and for Dave. It's finding the right candidate to fit in who fits with the brand. And it's a mutual approval process, just like getting a job. Um, the, the pain points to me are that I'm waking up, I'm paying 30, 40% of taxes on my W-2. I'm not seeing the number come to the bottom line. That grass is greener component of what does business look like on the other side? It, it's a, it goes back to the American dream, right? That's what people want to do. They want to have their own lifestyle. They have their own ownership, their freedom of, to be able to make the moves that they want to move and not, not be tied to a desk nine to five every single day. Okay, thanks. Um, Another question from the audience that kind of comes back to the, the first question about why people are leaving. Um, this person has said, you know, I, I am in a toxic culture, but I didn't really notice it before. Since the pandemic, now I'm feeling really restless. So what's really going on there? Um, why is it that we were putting up with it before? You know, what is it? What's happening there? So um, uh, Dave, how do you, how, what are your thoughts about that? Some of the conversations I would encourage folks to have. So being in a toxic work culture is terrible. So I, I want to preface that and say, that is where you spend the majority of your life. Get, get to a better place. And I also want to encourage folks to recognize that the past two years have been relatively toxic for everybody. And so we do a little bit of differentiation between, um, is, this, um, is this the work culture specifically, which it absolutely could be. And so really doing some dispassionate thinking about what, if the work culture here was better, would this be better for me? Or how much of it is, it's been such a stressful two years and people have been struggling to keep up, including your boss, including your coworkers, um, and where that may not be better somewhere else. You may be remembering when things were better or different places pre-pandemic. And I think a lot of places have been difficult to work at during the pandemic because we're all figuring this out together. Um, so that's not to, again, um, allow for any toxicity at work, but to sort of say, I think I get, I, we keep saying grass is greener, but just to recognize that some of the challenges you might be facing are probably universal. And some of them might be very specific, in which case, when you do that sort of dispassionate look, that's when you say, this workplace is toxic. Um, and again, that's you know, not to keep going back to old answers, but ask other folks and say, hey, I'm thinking about going there. And they might say, you know, oh, actually, it's been really bad here for the past two years. Not sure why. And, and you might get some more clarity there, too. Super. Thanks. Uh, Bethany, um, you may want to, if you want to respond to that, please do. But I'm going to add another question to the list which is about the remote uh, work. So I've got some questions about what this means for people. Um, and I know that, especially for employers now, um, Brian Kopp of Gartner Research says that there's a thicker and broader um, uh, number of employees out there now. It's very different. So anyway, let me just throw that out there as a topic and go, go for it. So timely, um, just, just a little context. Uh, we have about 5,500 people at my organization. It is global, uh, largely in the U.S., and we came out of financial services roots, even though we are a data technology company. So we have historically, and really most of COVID, uh, been very passionate about getting people back to office, right? That the, the secret sauce and the magic happens when people can collaborate in person. Um, we have had a change of leadership, um, and that culture has shifted. And our new CEO um, formed a committee called uh, the Future of Work Committee, of which I'm co-chairing. Uh, and we have about five weeks to figure out the future of what that looks like for our global organization, um, which is daunting, you know, and we, we've been back at home. Most of the, the leaders are, are in for the most part, um, but employees are back working from home. We had been in a hybrid environment prior to that three days in, two days out, but very structured. You couldn't take a Monday and a Friday off, you know, all of that. Um, and it is, you know, to, to, from an employer standpoint, the challenges are real. You know, we have roles that are in multiple countries that do range from frontline call center to PhD data scientists um, with all very different skills and daily tasks, you know, across that whole board. Um, and so really figuring out a model that works for an organization like that is quite a challenge. 
what I am feeling um, is is you can't you can't stand still and um, and expect people to be coming into an office in this climate. You will lose um, your competition is going to be more flexible than you. Uh, we have to think differently. Uh, the reason we were all you know kind of butts in seat um, was that that really comes from the industrial era and factories and and so work has changed and I think COVID spurred it more. Uh, but it really I think it's here to stay. That's that's not changing. Flexibility is going to be be critical moving forward. Forward. Um, so honestly, I don't have a magic formula for you. I don't know what my company is going to do. Um, I do know it will be way more flexible. Um, I do know we need to do that to attract talent. And going back to those principles I mentioned of, of trust, of understanding how to manage productivity um, in, in, in a um, non-office environment or a partial office environment is going to be really critical. And then figuring out how to keep your employees super engaged. Um, I think those are the three big things uh, that employers need to think about. Okay, cool. Um, follow up to that. I'm gonna stick with you for, for a moment, Bethany. Um, there is some research that shows that when you do, when you are the person who's preferring to work remotely, that you, even though you perform at the same levels, you get more negative feedback. So there's a little bit of a disconnection with your, with your boss. Um, and so that scares me on both ends. That scares me for both the employee, but it also scares me uh, for um, the employer who could lose someone because of whatever it is that negativity coming back because you're not in the office. And related to that, I know I'm really piling them on here for you. Hmm. Um, we also know that, that men are more likely to want to come back to the, to the work uh, place while women are more likely to be those who say, no, I want to stay remote. So given all that, what's your, what's your thoughts? Yeah, no, I think you're right. There is a lot of data that there about the gender differences, although I think um, I'm seeing that it might level off a little bit more with our younger generations. Um, I still think that uh, that women are more likely to need more flexibility. So for, again, another reason for employers to figure this out, to have better gender equity in their organizations. Um, you know, I, I think of, I, I, I have, um, I've worked with a colleague historically who uh, the emails that I would receive were, would, would get me up on fire, right? Um, and then I would actually get on video with her and it would be delightful. Um, and so uh, it kind of goes back to, yes, I think there's a lot that can be lost if we're not facing to face. The next best thing is making sure that there is, I'm a firm believer in video. My, and I think my company is a little unusual for this. I don't do a single zoom without being on camera. Um, it's, and, and I really expect that of my team. There is, you know, I come from sales roots. There's so much that happens when you have eye to eye contact. Right. Um, and so I think managers, leaders, I think we have to think about how do you engage differently? It can't just be all I am. It can't just be all email. Um, there has to be some more fun built in. We're missing those fun things things that happen when you're when you're sitting around how do you bake fun in you know every friday I, we have stand ups three times a week with my team um, which are just quick meetings to kind of catch up Fridays, they're free, and I, I assign a different person to lead them. Um, I don't, they don't want to hear from me every week, right? Um, and so a different person on the team will take that, and, and sometimes we're literally playing Pictionary for 30 minutes. Um, and yes, we have stuff we need to be doing, right? Um, but, you know, we need that time to just laugh and giggle and, and bond together um, to really feel like a team because we're not running to happy hour after work together, right? Um, because we're not all in the office. So I think we have to just get creative and don't forget the play. It's important. Yeah. I just want to follow, uh, just tag on to that just a little bit when yeah. you talked about the Please. differences between um, being promoted when you were working hybrid or remote. Um, I think when you're, when you're seeking a job, ask for what you need, but also look at what the company culture is. Will you be the only person or is that the culture? Is that the, the policy that folks are working hybrid and remote? And what's your boss going to be doing? Really best practice in a lot of ways for supervisors is to have the same schedule as their supervisees. So um, I know this is sort of my one example, but we have a three, two hybrid right now. And I, I would love to be in every day, but I'm trying to hold myself to working two days remote so that there's that, that where that inequity could come in or that misperception could come in, they're uh, trying to mitigate that. So I think looking for a place that gives you not just what you need, but where the culture sort of matches that as well is really important too. In my opinion, is it's all about navigation too, right? Communication is key. We, you, we're always going to agree on that. But how you navigate your firm and the business you work in, the people you work with, just because we're on a video call having a conversation as a team doesn't mean there's not a couple of calls happening in the background to either make sure, hey, are you prepared for this? Did you understand everything? Or the simple question is, is everything okay? And, and what's your life like right now? So 
building yeah. that inside. I love that, Carrie. I think we have to remember yeah. the human nature of it. Yes, absolutely. There's something that I refer to as psychological distance. Um, you know, uh, and when you're not in the office, you feel psychologically more distant, which requires more more communication. And and it's the boss who's in, in charge of that often, or should be. Um, staying with you, Carrie, I've had a couple of questions about um, ageism and, uh, you know, what's happening with that right now? You know, what do we need to worry if we're a little bit older? Um, but also a question about what if you're a white man and everybody seems to want to hire a, a diverse, a more diversity hires these days. Um, maybe you could speak to that in a number of ways. That's a, I like the second question. So the first one is really easy. So um, I work with a, a couple of different brands and, and very easy to explain that we see about 75% of our candidates are between the ages of 40 and 65 years old. All right. So when somebody goes to move from a career into an investment where they're going to be their own boss, there's a couple things that happen. Number one, they've usually gone through their experience working in the W-2 or having a job. The second thing is they've amassed some wealth and they have some disposable income. So most people that I work with who are looking at a franchise, they are over 40 years old. You get a couple of people in their mid 30s, but it's typically somebody who's had some luck or is relatively well funded. So for us, there's no ageism. Bring it over. We'll have the conversation with you. Um, you know, I, I represent a fitness brand that specifically targets people between the ages of 45 and 65 years old. It's a genius concept. Um, let's see, as far as a white male in the workforce, well, thanks, Vanessa. So I, I'm Jewish, guys. I'm, I'm a minority. I guess I'm, I'm sidestepping the question, but uh, I kid. I, I, think it's, I think it's a real challenge. I think, you know, for me personally, I've had this, this thought a lot of different times as to when I go apply and I look at, you know, my capabilities on paper versus how I show up. It's, it's not the easiest thing these days. And um, that is not the right answer because obviously we should be opening up to every single person who's qualified and, and has the capability to do it. Um, and one of the things that, you know, in my background, I've had the luxury of being able to work with white collar teams and with blue collar teams. I, I ran a union shop in Brooklyn. And um, that was an eye-opening experience to work with some people who just don't have some of the fundamentals that we feel like are, are given to us, right? Um, sitting down with, with my team of six people and explaining to them um, how to invest in the stock market, right? How to buy shares of Apple, was something that, that they had never seen before. And so I'm totally open to every, every single opportunity. Um, you know, I, I work with a variety, a huge variety of people from uh, within the United States, but it is the absolute melting pot. I mean, that franchise industry has a reputation of, of being approachable for more than just, you know, the typical white male. Super, thanks. Um, Bethany, uh, we've got somebody in our audience who is um, worried about the idea of people working remotely and is, you know, trying to recruit people and everybody wants to work remotely. Um, but you're, as you mentioned, there you're, you're missing something. You know, how do you create that full collaboration? How do you learn from one another? Um, do, how much do we need to be worried about that? And you've, you've talked about a few workarounds, um, but if could, could you add a little bit more to that? And then I'm going to also open that question up to 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 uh, our two guys. So just start with yourself, please. You know, it's a great challenge. And again, I don't know what the exact formula is. I do, I do know that you can find more talent, the more flexible you are. If you're not um, requiring people to be in office, like for instance, hiring here in Dallas, if I need people to be within 50 miles of Dallas, um, that limits my pool. Whereas if I can say I can find a data scientist or software engineer anywhere in the country, uh, it's a much bigger pool for me, right? Um, but at the same time, you know, I do know that we do learn a lot from each other and from that collaboration. And it is harder to replicate that, not impossible, but harder to replicate that, um, you know, through tools um, uh, online. There, but there are so many tools. You know, we see our tech teams are constantly communicating on things like Slack. Our software engineers are all pair programming. So they're literally one person is typing and the other person is, you know, talking them through it and they're seeing the same screen, right? So they are, they are as, as collaboration as it gets, right? In that mode. Um, so that is happening um, daily, uh, you know, making sure that there are mentors and buddy systems in place 
particularly as you onboard. That's where I have the most concern is onboarding. Um, I think those first six months are probably the most critical in helping people to get trained up and, and acclimated to the role. So I think you have to have uh, you know, more intensive communication than a lot of um, mentors and buddies connected uh, to make sure that those people do get onboarded. Um, they learn what they need to learn and they feel connected. Um, I just think it takes a different set of communication skills. It's gonna take over communication. Uh, we can't, you know, we can't sit back um, and probably lead the way we used to lead. This is going to take new skills for leaders. We were, we're talking about that quite a bit when we talk about this future of work committee. How do we upskill our leaders to lead in this new environment? Um, and it is, it's different. It, it's going to take going to take work um, in, a, in a different way and, and a sensitivity in a different way. Super, thanks. Yeah, I can speak sort of personal experience in that one. I, I started my new position currently um, in July of 2020. So I started remote in this new position. And then I had the opportunity to quadruple the size of my team. So I hired about 17 people who started remote and we interviewed remotely. And it's been interesting. Um, it's been really different. And I, I would just want to second everything that Bethany said. Um, I think it's both the leadership skills. I also think that we're trying to train students now and in, in, uh, job seekers to build the skills that they need to sort of ask for what they need. There are things that happen incidentally when you're starting a new job that you sort of bump into someone or learn this thing. And I think for everybody, how can you be a more active learner at work? Um, I think is really important. Um, and you know, the other thing too is th th really thinking about what those meetings are for. So we want to meet more often to do what? And it's not necessarily, as you were saying, Bethany, we can code this way, we can do this. It's to get that trust and that sense of belonging. That's the thing that's missing. And so when we meet more often, how do we not use those as a daily rundown of the agenda, but how do we use those as a, how was your weekend? Because that's not happening in any other way. Um, so, but it's it's so many different things all coinciding at once, but it, it takes both sides. It, both, it takes the employees and the leadership to both learn how to ask for what they need. Yeah, and hey, I, I love, I love that. I just want to add, I always tell my team um, to say, or I try and say to them, paint done for me. Or they say that to me, sorry, paint done for me. What does done look like, right? Because so often we'll just say, hey, go, go work on this project for me. And I don't tell them exactly what I want. And they come back and they spend all this time and then they deliver. And then I'm like, oh, no, exactly what I wanted. But I didn't do the greatest job in the upfront telling them exactly right. what I wanted. And they didn't ask me, what does that look like? So yeah. I think that the two, the two pieces there, Dave, are so critical. And then just the success of asking questions, right? The the people who are going to rise to the top are the ones who are curious and the ones who are poking around. And you know, we talked about how do you you know check on the status of somebody in the cube next to you or or remotely. I mean, we have all these phenomenal tools at our resource. I can see how many people watch a Zoom call. I can see the last person to look at our CRM board. I can see the last person to put uh, put an input. Uh, or look at our, our Google uh, Sheets. Like I can see who's working and who's doing the right things, and they're ultimately going to get more efficient and be more successful as a result of that. You would ask a question, Minister, earlier about ageism, and I think that actually plays into this in a strange way. So, a lot of what the the market moving in, in employability hiring is around skills based hiring. So, what are the fundamental skills? It's not necessarily a specific task that you're good at, but the skills that you bring from industry to industry. So critical thinking or technology skills. And there really are two big buckets sort of in this future of work piece. There's the technology skills. I can learn new programming. I, I, I can work on Slack. And then there's this fundamental um, with soft skills is the sort of very old way to put it, but problem solving, communication, teamwork. And oftentimes people who are more experienced in the field just have more experience doing that, working through problems with the team, being a leader on projects. And so I think for folks who feel like they might be behind the eight ball on the technology side, companies can teach you how to use Slack. What they're looking for are people who can be problem solvers together on a team because they, they are, this new environment really has new problems every day, new challenges every day. So they want someone who has experience with that. So I'd say being more vocal about your, again, those sort of transferable uh, soft skills can help with that ageism piece a little bit too. And even picking up the phone, right? So there's like the old school mindset, people who are a little bit older, they, they're like, yeah, we pick up the phone, we have conversations. Um, not calling out millennials because I technically Dave and I are millennials, but I mean, our, our generation is getting a little bit of a bad rap because we're like, oh yeah, we texted that person. We sent an email. Did you call them and get the, the answer you're looking for? So being, being uh, aggressive and pursuing what you're looking for is going to rise, rise that person right up. Amen. And I think you just called me out for not being a millennial. Did you answer your phone though? <laughs> um, I, I, I say this all the time with my team, you know, I really, you can solve so many more problems when you actually, you know, are talked to a human versus that, that I am or that email. Sure. 
Uh, we also know, you know, emotional intelligence is something that we talk a lot about, um, you know, talk a lot about at the business school. Um, and we know that as you get older, you become more emotionally intelligent just by virtue of having experienced w way more emotions, way more ups and downs that make you more empathetic. Um, another question that I think we can think about from both the, the employee standpoint and the employer standpoint. Um, and the question is about how you know when it's ready to leave, when you're, when you're ready to leave or when it's time to leave. Um, and uh, so when you're the employee, uh, how do you know that? When you're the employer, how do you keep your eyes peeled for those moments when that person might be ready to leave? So let's start with the, with the um, employee. And um, I don't know who, who, who wants to answer that. Let you leap in. How do you know? Harry, how did you know? How did I know? Yeah, I, I didn't have a choice. My employer made a decision for me. Um, but in retrospect, I mean, best decision ever made. Um, you know, I think, you know, I made a comment earlier about how, how much taxes you're paying on your W-2 and what's that holding you down for. And it's very, very easy to fall into a comfortable job and get paid and wake up every day and do your thing and not take the time to think outside of what are my aspirations? What am I missing? What am I really want to do? And I think if we, I hate the word pivot, but if we pivot back to what the whole point of, of this presentation is, is we had a humongous opportunity to sit down, spend some time with our families. Most of us like them. Um, so we got to enjoy that and, and make some new friends. And some of us have life changing experiences during that time frame. And it became a real question of, am I going to go back to what I was dealing with before? And two months out of the office for some of us, for some of us more, six, eight months, gives you a real opportunity to sit back and say, this isn't what I like. I want to try something new. Cool. From an employer perspective, um, I love, I, I think we do need to be very aware of our employees and where their career growth is, what they want for career growth. Not everybody wants to continue to grow, right? Some people are, are very happy um, in their current roles, but for, for those that, that do want growth, um, these need to be regular conversations, I think, to understand where people are headed, what they need to get to that next step. Is that next step in your organization? Is it in, is it in a, a fellow team's um, you know, organization? How can you get them there? Um, how can you uh, uh, help them find mentors to get them to that next step? Um, so I think those are things that as leaders, we need to be really actively having those conversations. And then we also, as an organization, need to be thinking through that, those succession plans. Um, and so really understanding, you know, where your, pe your people should be growing, right? And so who's going to be stepping into those roles and what does that timeline look like? How can you be networking them around um, and then getting ready to, to bring that next person into your organization? So um, it's really an ongoing continuum in my mind. And then I think from the employee standpoint, you know, those same questions, am I growing? Um, am I challenged? Am I excited? Am I curious? Um, is this still, do I love my colleagues? I think those are all the, the questions to be asking. Is there still more for me to do in this role or am I, am I tapping it out? And Super. Bethany, would you think, sorry, Dave, would you think that that would be a fair question of an employee to, to come to the table asking those things? Or would you 100%. be, would you be, because I think a lot of people, they get nervous when they go in interviews. So they don't necessarily feel comfortable saying, hey, I want to know what my upside potential is in five mm -hmm. years, right? So what, what would that look like for in an interview? I, I think that's really positive. Like we're looking for people to come join an organization and stay and grow um, and not just hop from one job to another. So if you say, look, you know, I'm really interested in finding an organization where I can really grow um, up through the, my career. I'd love to hear, you know, what, what could that look like in five years and 10 years? Um, that would be a huge positive. And then I also think it's something that we should feel comfortable going to our bosses with, right? Um, been in this role a year, loving it, but I do know there's more for me. You know, let's, can you help me think about what that next step might look like and how I get there? Um, great leaders are going to help you have that conversation. Absolutely. Super. I think when's the right Thank time you. to leave? I think there's a sweet spot. I just want to call out. I, I think that there's a sweet spot between too early and too late. And I think identifying that spot where you can leave, um, on your terms from a company um, and not feel like you're you're dropping a mic on a company because it's, you know, I think in the great reshuffle, so many people are moving so many places and how do you sort of leave with good grace at a place? I think that, you know, you don't want to stay too long. I also think, you know, um, Bethany, you mentioned mentorship and that's one thing I want to call out too is that you can be having really negative experiences at a place 
like to process this with somebody who knows that profession too and say, here's what I'm, ha- here's what I'm experiencing here. They can help bounce back with you and say like, yeah, this sounds like a time to leave or it sounds like you have a problem with this person or it sounds like X, Y, or Z. So I think um, if you want some maturity, having, and it's hard, to, it's easy to say, get a mentor. Go back five years, develop a mentor, and then today, today talk to that person. But I think, you know, talking it out and taking some time to be as objective as you can too. So, you know, over time, sort of writing down at the end of each week, this week, still wasn't feeling it this week. So, to, so you can look back and say, there's a trend here. This is time to, it's time to go. And, and I think it's important too, to, on the mentor piece, like don't wait for your company to assign one, right? When I said that term navigate before, go find somebody who's doing the job that you want or you think you want ask them, ask them out, right? Let's, let's grab lunch. Let's get a cup of coffee. And, you know, I, I watched the movie wall street the other day on an airplane. And it's like, you're the guy who called my office 54 days in a row. Like, well, he got the, he got the customer, right? He got the job. So go in there and be persistent and don't be afraid to ask for a mentorship. I, I'm still well, doing- how do you do that? Say something about how you do that. And I, I know a lot of my students say, are you just supposed to say, will you be my mentor? Well, I think, I think, yeah, that's an easy way to do it, right? Uh, another way is you'll hear people, like I think the three of us on this call at the end will say, hey, if there's any questions, reach out to us, right? It, you know, maybe call us a couple of times and develop a relationship before asking for a mentorship, but you just say, hey, listen, I, I want to get to know you. I would love to hear. I'm, I'm, I'm young. I'm, I'm eager. I want to learn. And, you know, any leader who's worth their salt is going to pour into the, the the person asking that question. And I just did a quick look. There are 108 108- UNH, 108,000 UNH alumni, when you look at alumni on LinkedIn, people who have listed UNH as um, their alma mater, um, and you can then sort that down by where do they live, what industry do they have, what job, what um, when did they graduate, what was their major, um, so that's a great way to reach out and say, hey, I'm also UNH grad, hey, we might have over our paths might have crossed, um, and so that's an easy way to find one piece of connecting info, but if you don't know how to use the alumni search tool on LinkedIn, if you search UNH um, on LinkedIn and go to their alumni tab. It's an easy to sort through everybody who's listed it. That's what I always recommend that people do first. Um, Cause you have that, you know, that camaraderie with somebody. And the, the best part of that is they have at least two friends, right? So you go from 108 to like 300,000 pretty quick. So ask them. yes, you do. Yes, you do. Yeah. And, and I, I think, just want to say, oh, oh, go ahead, Bethany, go ahead. You know, mentorship, I think sometimes that does some intimidating, like the label. So maybe we remove the label. Like it's just, you, you know, you chat a couple of times and, and maybe sometimes that relationship, that friendship grows and that's a mentor. Like when I think back to my mentors, I never formally said, hey, will you be my mentor? It just evolved, right? To, to you know, to the conversation here. Um, but I also do think it doesn't hurt to ask And I want to say it doesn't hurt to ask for a new job. Um, I have asked for almost every promotion I've gotten. Um, Remember, politely persistent. I was charming. Um, You have to ask. Our bosses... They, they love us, they adore us, but they're not, we're not always top of mind. They're solving a gazillion problems, right? And so they're not always thinking, gosh, Bethany's probably ready for her next step. Um, sometimes you just have to nudge a little and don't be afraid to do that. Yeah, I encourage folks to, to take a look at the idea of job crafting. It's not always possible in every single scenario, but if you come to your, your supervisor and say, I've thought through what I'd like my new next job to be, and maybe it doesn't exist, or maybe what this new title could be for me, and I've done some of the work. And I think that's the other thing too, is the employer, your, your boss might say like, that's great, but like, what do you know, if you give them the data and the, the job description that you would love to have, that saves them some steps. It helps them talk to their, you know, HR, et cetera. So, um, and might help you clarify too. Like if I had to put into writing what my dream job is, this would be it. Um, so you're helping them solve a need potentially, but also you're helping them sort of get two steps ahead on that process. Sure, sure. Yeah, some of the saying, own your own development. Yeah, that's absolutely something we've been trying to teach at the business school for a while. Um, another question, um, well, first of all, I want to make a point here. Um, if, if, if you send one email and nobody responds, send a second. I get so uh, yeah, many emails. I, time out. I will tell you, I was a marketer for years. And there's if you get a 30% response rate on your emails, one out of three people read that. All right. When I want to get people's attention, I send 12 emails over four weeks. Yeah. Don't, don't hesitate to resend. Don't take it personally because and I know it feels personal, but I get so many that sometimes I just lose track. So resend, resend. Um, another question, and I think, I'm, uh, Dave, you're probably the person to start with this. Like the LinkedIn resource, what are some other resources? Where can people go to learn more about jobs and, and um um, the kinds of um, industries that they might want to work in or what, what's, 
what would fit them? Do you have any thoughts on that? Platforms, resources, that's the question. Yeah, I can't say I can't say enough about LinkedIn just because it's such a communal place where you can do a lot of that development and you can put a lot up about yourself too. So someone can learn a lot about your professional accomplishments, your wants, your dreams, your desires, if you do a good job there. So LinkedIn is kind of where I'd start, but to move aside from that, um, because things are moving so quickly, I would say this sounds really dry in comparison, but the Bureau of Labor Statistics, like what are jobs that you might not know are new and existed, but are actually up and coming? And you might learn a little bit about what are some industries that maybe aren't part of your um, your experience, but you're like, oh, that's an up and coming field. I had no idea. And I'm maybe interested in that. Um, so it's a it's a it's a far second <laughs> to, to LinkedIn in the amount of you know human contact you have. But everything is different today than it was six months ago, than it was two years ago. And that is a site that has as current as you can try to get data about what's happening in the world and industry. So if you start to, to parse through that, and they have some tools to help sort of lay people understand the BLS statistics too. So we, we have some of our current college students going there and finding out about that too. So it's an approachable website, but it's up to date, which is the important part. Super. Others? Other, uh... Bethany or, or Carrie, do you have any resources like that? We spend far too much money as a company uh, on LinkedIn. It is the number one way to recruit candidates. Um, I, I, you know, I buy a million other tools for my team and LinkedIn is still the primo one. So um, it, it really is. If somebody can come up with a competitive solution, I will buy it. Um, uh, but no, it, it really is the great way, greatest way to network. Social media, though, is also great. You know, I mean, the Instagrams and the Facebooks and all that are still relevant um, and really connecting with people as well. So I think don't don't overlook those. Um, um, important to build your brand, you know, particularly on those social sites. So be intentional about what you want that brand to look like. I always say don't, don't, you know, I think the old advice was be careful on social. I think the, the new advice is be intentional on social, right, about what that brand looks like. Can you give us an example of that? How do you, build, uh, I'd love to hear that from each of you as a closing comment. What is your brand and what does mm -hmm. that look like and how do you, be, how do you be intentional? Mm -hmm. Um. So two examples, personal. So someday, maybe there's a UNH alum out there who will hire me. I want to get into the food, beverage, cocktail industry of some sort, oysters, you name it. Um, that's my dream uh, next career. So I have started a food blog on my own, right, on the side, um, and sort of building that brand, uh, connecting with uh, restaurateurs and, and chefs and people in that industry. So maybe someday it will pay off. I don't have any evidence yet. Um, but uh, we, we see the same thing like with our software engineers. I think they do a great job of getting out into social, um, having their own uh, website showing off technology, cool side projects, uh, putting blogs out there about new technologies. Those are portfolios that they really can show when they're interviewing. Um, and it kind of highlights that curiosity, that, that drive on their own to do these cool things, right? Super. Yeah, I, think, I think, you know, showing success, Dave, we'll let you anchor this one, man. So I think showing success on, on, on social is key. I mean, if, if you guys look at my LinkedIn, you're going to see I'm putting short clips out there, uh, reposting a ton of content. It's, it's really easy to post content. That's all you need to know. You don't need to write a paragraph. You can literally write one or two sentences and get a thousand likes. All right. It's, it's that simple. So just doing it is, I think, the first step. I think the secondary step is layering in the content. And, you know, Bethany, if you want to get in the restaurant industry, I have this emerging franchise in the, in the quick serve. I'm just kidding. So <laughs> um, darn. <laughs> So it, it's 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 going out there, making sure the presence is known, making sure you're connecting with people. I mean, Dave, you linked in with me right before this this call started. We can see what connections we have in common, and it's just like asking for a mentor. Go out and link in with every single person who's in your field, build your database, and communicate to it. I think building the profile is one thing, an important thing, and then also go out there and comment on people's posts. I think I know, I know the people who keep commenting on my stuff. I'm like, I know that name, and they're becoming known to me because they say interesting things. And so you can do that. Um, and then another sort of everything everyone said. Um, I'm embarrassed to say I found DaveMary.com. I bought it. Um, it was it's ten bucks a year on HostGator. Um, um, it can't be David Mary. Someone else. It's a Can Canadian magician owns DavidMary.com. Um, <laughs> But you know, it's such a small thing. I took a, like a couple of weekends to put it together and now it's really unique. It's super old. I'm embarrassed to talk about it now. I haven't looked at it in a year, but things like that, that feel like they're big, you know, that set you apart, that differentiate you. People are like, wow, I can find a lot more about him. Um, it can be a small investment for a big payoff. Um, so that's going the extra mile, but LinkedIn can't say enough. Yeah. Cool. What about you, Vanessa? 
Uh, my brand? Yeah. <laughs> Good question. My brand is I'm, I've got one leg in, in uh, organizations. I do a lot of consulting and I care a lot. The other leg is in, um, is in research. And so all of my research focuses on what's going on in organizations. I'm a team expert. Love it. Belonging in particular. I'm focusing on how do you build belonging in a team? But we are about out of time and it's been such a pleasure to chat with you. I really appreciate your engagement. And on behalf of UNH and the faculty at UNH, come back and see us, please. So thank you, uh, Dave, Bethany, Carey. you are awesome. And thanks for representing UNH out in the world. Thank you. Thank you for having us. Bye-bye folks.